In the first three chapters of the novel, we are introduced to Jane and her doleful state as orphan ward and unwanted relative of the Reeds. The Reed children's cruelty and vapid nature is dwelt upon and contrasted to Jane's deep thinking and engagement in a world beyond the confines of Gateshead. We see that Jane is the outsider in a variety of ways as she cannot fit in with the servants despite being treated like less than one, nor can she fit in with the Reed children because they do not see her as equal or worthy. Georgiana, Eliza and especially John Reed berate and beat her. Ideas of slavery and mastery are overtly introduced with allusions to Roman tyrants and a frank discussion about bending one's will to a master. There are repeated images of restriction and a sense of being caged in these chapters. This is certainly evident in the windows and mirrors Jane interacts with. We are able to see that she is literally separated by the different rooms she must enter to escape John Reed, her own self-enclosure in the window seat, and her longing looks out into the white mist. Readers see that Jane is held away from what she wants to attain, even if she doesn't know what this is, but all Jane sees is blankness. This passage highlights her disconnectedness. It also introduces the motif of restriction and the theme of passion versus reason. Let's unpack it looking first at the restriction. To the passage. Folds of scarlet drapery shut in my view to the right hand. To the left were the clear panes of glass, protecting, but not separating me from the drear November day. At intervals, while turning over the leaves of my book, I studied the aspect of that winter afternoon. Afar, it offered a pale blank of mist and cloud. Near, a scene of wet lawn and storm beat shrub, with ceaseless rain sweeping away wildly before a long and lamentable blast. Bronte uses ekphrastic description to show how Jane is closed in by the reeds and reinforces that she is left to watch the family from afar. Readers are able to understand the familiar imagery of the painting, seeing that Jane is bound by curtains, which are classically artistic, and behind the pane of glass. The idea of restriction is obviously enhanced through connotations of a moment or person frozen in time, like the figures of a painting. The pane of glass protecting, but not separating, may seem paradoxical. However, when readers recognise that this puts Jane into the position of being unable to break free, despite knowing that the storm of the reeds, which she must weather, is not right, we comprehend then that this renders her restricted and powerless. Bronte enhances Jane's restriction through the pale blank of mist, which has connotations of something impenetrable, being shrouded, and even being held back. While blank, with its links to the phrase blank page, could be suggestive of, or foreshadowing opportunity, its presentation in the context of the storm tells readers that Bronte is drawing on the connotations of emptiness and being trapped. Deeper reading into the colour imagery also tips us off to the other motifs and ideas that present themselves in the novel. While red can be linked to negativity, and especially the destruction of fire, here the word scarlet is reminiscent of warmth and protection, showing that Jane's self-imposed exile will play a large part in the rest of her story. Later, readers also become aware that the dichotomy between the colours is symbolic of her passion and reason, respectively. This motif of restriction and the theme of passion versus reason is extended in the Red Room. There, the idea of female autonomy and agency is also apparent, as is the idea that women are the ones binding each other. This is very literally represented in the use of garters and Mrs Reed's decree that only Jane restricting herself will set her free. Let's look at the garters line. If you don't sit still, you must be tied down, says Bessie. Miss Abbott, lend me your garter, she would break mine directly. Miss Abbott turned to divest a stout leg of the necessary ligature. This preparation for bonds and the additional ignominy it inferred took a little of the excitement out of me. Don't take them off, I cried. I will not stir. Several things are important here. Bessie does not think her garters are strong enough, but Miss Abbott's will work. Bessie's characterisation later in the novel shows that her ideas are aligned with Jane's, though her position as servant and supplicant does not allow her to profess these. The garter was used to hold a woman's stocking up and, resultantly, is an intimate personal symbol of womanhood and femininity. The bonding of another female with a symbol of female restriction is obvious and shows a complete lack of agency by the women and from the women. Bronte then uses the term ignominy, with its denotations of public shame in two ways. First, to indicate Jane's passionate response to her passion being punished. 
And secondly, to signpost readers' attention to the idea that women restricting other women was abhorrent. Jane's defeat leaves Abbott with the appropriate feminine restriction in place as she does not remove her stockings or garters and forces Jane to bond herself to the seat. Bronte's choice might have been missed by contemporaneous readers, but contemporary readers are able to take this feminist reading. Jane's release from the Red Room heralds her first act of kindness from another person. Bessie takes pity on her and tries to comfort and warm Jane. Readers see that this is effective to some point as the imagery of fire is now softer and warmer than before, as Jane moves to the nursery hearth with all its symbolic resonance. But Jane has been changed and her moments of restriction as a result of her passion dull her world. This is represented in her disinterest in the bird plate that had so fascinated her and her reinterpretation of Gulliver's travels. Bronte enhances and continues the motif of restriction through the circlet of pastry and the wreath of convolvi on the plate. Chapter 3 appears to end on a more positive, if confusing, note for Jane. Mr Lloyd seeks to petition her mistress, Mrs Reed, to send Jane to school. Ostensibly, this is for better air and an environment that is less strenuous on Jane's nerves, but Mr Lloyd's intentions appear to be kindly. The conclusion of Chapter 3 also reveals that Jane comes from a union that society would have frowned upon. Her mother went against the family wishes and married a poor clergyman for love. This can certainly add to our understanding of the theme of passion versus reason, but it also plants a seed for the themes of gender and societal expectations. These two themes and the views of those within the novel are evident in the penultimate lines where Bessie and Abbott discuss that Jane should be pitied, but that it is difficult to love such an ugly creature. Jane is compared not for the first or last time in her life to someone who is more beautiful and pleasant. A curious reader will see that these characters Jane is compared to are all insipid and spiritless, suggesting that Jane's guise and character are indeed superior, despite what others think. So what have we learned from the opening chapters? The novel is certainly rich in symbolism and imagery, which we can explore in a variety of ways. We have also learned that a lot of this early imagery helps us to understand that Jane is restricted in both physical and emotional ways as well as being restricted by the society she lives in and the gender that she is. One of the main themes that is introduced is that of passion versus reason, and the novel is certainly starting to make comment on whether or not one is better than the other, or if there are equally important parts. As you keep reading, you should look for how these ideas are added to or changed. We have also been introduced to the very heavy-handed symbolism of the fire that continues to rage throughout the novel. Keep investigating how this is being used and how it changes over Bronte's novel.